three chairs. Pardon me? One more, one more announcement. Uh, there's a games night for adults here at uh, Board Games Night here on October 18th, Friday night, 7 till 9. So it says bring your own treats, but coffee and tea are provided. Bring your favorite game, no playing cards. Before you leave here today, you'll know on which one of these chairs you sit. You'll know probably, in all probability, which chair your parents sat, which chair your grandparents sat, maybe which chair your children sit, and maybe even which chair your grandchildren sit or will sit. A number of years ago, I was at a preacher's conference, and a very well-known speaker, conference speaker, a writer, an author, preacher, got up and he said, my kids hate me. They hate me and because of that, they've fallen into moral and spiritual decay. He said that you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was floored. How could this happen? How on earth could anything like that happen in a family like that? And as, I, as I began to think about it, I thought, wait a minute. You're a father. You've got boys, you've got sons. <clears throat> and as a parent, <clears throat> I don't think there's any one thing that could be worse than someone going up to my sons or one of my sons and saying, you're Bill and Chris McLean's son, aren't you? What was it like growing up in that home? And have them respond with, I hate my father. I couldn't think of one thing worse than for that to happen. Really, that thought has haunted me for many years. But why is it, folks, that even in the most godly homes, even the most godly people have rebellious children, even in churches like this, and so often things like that happen and, and we don't want to talk about it, so what ends up happening is it gets swept under the carpet because we don't know what to do with it, so we just put it under the carpet. But why is it that so many evangelical works, parachurch organizations, and churches that are founded on the truth of Scripture fall into moral decay and spiritual decay? Well, I want to see if today, from Scripture, we can find the answer to that. Let's look at some families in Scripture today. And as we do, I want you to think about what chair you might be in. Let's look at some families from Scripture, as I said. And we're going to go to Joshua chapter 24. So if you've got your Bible, and I hope you do, join me in Joshua chapter 24. And we'll pick it up beginning in verse 14. Joshua is writing, it's the last book, the last chapter of his book, and he says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua, he sat in the hot seat. That's this one. That's the hot seat. He, he was a first, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He had a heart for God, and he expressed it. But now what about... Joshua's children. What about that generation that came after Joshua, that grew up in that godly first chair home? Well, if you just look down to verse 31 in chapter 24, we see that Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days 
of the elders, that's his children, who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. So Joshua sat in the first chair. The next generation sat in the second chair. Saved? Saved. But now what about the generation that followed that generation, the third generation? We have to flip over to Judges chapter 2 and verse 10 for this. But it's still talking about the same group of people. Joshua has died. And in verse 10 of chapter 2 of Judges, it says, when all of that generation, second chair, when all of that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the works that he had done for Israel. Now that blows me away because when this generation had, had been uh, had joined their fathers, as, as it said, had been gathered to their fathers, this generation came after them and they didn't know the Lord. This is Joshua's grandchildren. They didn't know the Lord. Saved? Saved? Not saved. Born again? Born again? Not born again. They knew the Lord. They knew the Lord. But another generation comes along and they didn't know about the miracles. They didn't know about the works that had taken place in Joshua's generation. They didn't know about Jericho and the walls falling down. Can you think about that? They didn't know about the sun and the moon standing still or about the, the river being part of the Jordan River. They had no idea about that. That generation didn't know about the works of that generation. Now, I want to put some words on these chairs. First chair over here, that's commitment, commitment. You see, when you have a home that's committed, that knows the Lord, committed to the Lord, loves the Lord, <coughs> is sold out to the Lord, you will have children who sometimes, usually between the ages of six and 13 years old, will become Christians. Why is that? It's because that, that um, commitment that their parents have kind of leaks over into the lives of their children. It leaches into the lives of the children. And when you grow up in a Christian home, second chair um, home, um, that's what's happening. That's how, because that's why you become a Christian at that young age. You know, it's, it's really not your commitment. It's, it's your parents. You grew up with it, and, and it's part of who you are, part of who you are as a Christian. And pretty soon, when you grow up with that kind of a commitment, you don't have that commitment. It's not yours. You begin to have compromise. And so what happens is that it's, it's God. See, with this person over here, it's God and then me. It's God and then me. This person moves into compromise and it starts out like that. God and then me, but pretty soon, over a period of time, something happens and it becomes more about me and then God. And you grow up with that. And so you begin to compromise. And when you grow up in a home that's filled with compromise, you have conflict. You have conflict. Commitment, compromise, and conflict. This chair always is at that place in their life where they just can't find themselves. And this person you never hear Wondering, you know, who am I? What am I? Where am I? You never worry about this. This this person here probably doesn't say it too much, you know. You won't hear this person saying, I can't find myself. But you hear this person over here saying it all the time. Let me explain. You can find this pattern, by the way, of commitment, compromise, and conflict all the way through families in Scripture all the way through families in scripture. Look at Abraham. Abraham was a man that was sold out 
to God. God took him from out of the Ur of the Chaldees and took him to a different land, and he went. He obeyed. He went with God. And then you come to Isaac. Isaac was a compromising individual. He was a compromising man. Then you come to Jacob. And Jacob was filled with compromise, which eventually leaned into conflict, which became conflict, full-blown. Jacob wrestled with his parents. He wrestled with God. He wrestled with himself. And, and he didn't really get it together for an awfully long, long time. But there's another characteristic here that, that you know, that, that we can see just evident in these families. First chair Christians are a generation that put people first. It doesn't matter what they're, you know, whether they're introverts or, or, or extroverts or whatever it is, they're always helping and caring for people. Their first chair, that's their priority. <coughs> However, when you grow up in a home with that kind of stuff going on, with all the right morals, all the right ethics, that characteristic moves slowly, not too quickly, slowly, to possessions. And you end up with people, possessions, and purposelessness. Purposelessness. First chair Christians love people and uses things. Second chair person loves people and uses things, but then it changes and and you know it's it, it's God and then me. And then it's, it's me, and then God. It starts out that way, but in time, they begin to use people and love things. And when you grow up in a, in a home where the accumulation of things becomes the mindset of that home, it becomes the priority of that home, and, and you know, that job, that position, and, and those, those accumulation of things is the priority, then this generation, has big time problems, big time problems. And we all know people who gave everything they could to their kids except themselves. They gave the kids anything and everything they wanted except themselves. Let's put another family here, King David. Chair number one, King David. David was a man after God's own heart. Saul gave David a physical kingdom to which David turned into a spiritual kingdom to which Solomon slowly over a period of time eroded into a physical kingdom again and then Rehoboam and we all know how evil Rehoboam was he destroyed the whole kingdom first God and then me first God and then me second chair it's me and then God. Third chair, scripture just tells us just how, how bad Rehoboam was. So where are you today? If I were to ask your kids which chair they'd put you on, what chair would they put you on? Do you put people first? Are you sold out to the Lord? Is he clearly number one in your life? Or, or, or is it God sometimes and sometimes it's me and it's me and sometimes God? You know what that is? That's half-heartedness. And when you have half-heartedness and you're trying to instill godly principles into a family, it doesn't work because that half-heartedness becomes a place where there's no heart left at all. You see, there's a big difference between this chair and that one. My wife said, you know, you really should put the comfortable chair over there and put the other one here. But it's, this one is real comfortable. It's really easy to sit in the number two. It really is. So again, if I were to ask you, where would your kids, where would your family put you? What would you say? Probably not too much. You see, chair number one and chair number two look the same, but there's a huge difference. They look the same, and that's the trouble. They look the same. 
You can't look at a person and say, aha. I'm sorry, Mark. <laughs> Second chair Christian. I can't do that because this is a godly man. He comes here and he worships and he leads and, and all of that. But you can't because they look the same. And I'm using you as an illustration. And, and the, the furthest thing from my mind is to put you in chair number two. I want to put you in chair number one and follow you. But the idea is that they look the same. Here's the thing. This, this person in chair number two looked the same. They can probably recite the words of the, or the books of the Bible and maybe even backwards because they grew up in a Christian home and they were in Sunday school all the time and they learned it and, and could probably do it. And it's important for chair number two to have position. It's important for them to be in, in, a, in a part of leadership. Chair number one, it's, it's not so so important to be in the in the you know in the limelight. Not so important at all. Chair number one doesn't need a new car every two or three years, but to this person, that's very important. Possessions. Think about this. Go with me on this. Second chair family on their way to church, and they got to drive to get there, and and um, they're 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 arguing. Mom and dad are arguing and they're, they're fighting and bickering. Kids are in the backseat, little boy and little girl, and they're bickering and arguing and carrying on sibling rivalry and all of that. They pull into the parking lot at church. I can't get too far away from this thing. They pull into the parking lot at church and, and um, dad gets out of the car. He walks around, opens the door for mom. She gets on his arm and they walk into the church. Pastor's at the door and he says, Brother, I was thinking, would you mind giving your testimony this morning in, in the worship service? I'd be honored to. Mm -hmm. He comes in, he sits with his wife, and, and um, the kids are there as well with them, and he gets up and he prays down the fire. He prays, and, and I mean, earth is shaking. And then he shares, and he says, when I was seven years old, I was a sinful, wicked individual. The God of heaven came down and saved my wretched soul. This book is the most important thing in my life. It's the most important thing that I have in my life. And the son is sitting in the front row and elbows a little girl and says, check this out. Check this out. You know, this, this is, is, is what he's seeing. Is he sees dad go home and take the most important book in his life, throw it on the coffee table, get the remote, put on the football, put on the game, go to sit down at the table. The same one he heard, pray down the fire from heaven, says, bless the food, bless the, the missionaries, now pass the meat. You know, that, that's the reality of it. Before long, the person that's growing up in that home has conflict. The person that's growing up in that home has a real problem with the church. Because as far as they're concerned, this person and that person are the same because they look the same. They look the same. Everybody looks the same. I can't look at you and tell you which chair you're in, but your kids can. Trouble is, the only testimony this man has, this person has, is what happened to them at the time of salvation, their conversion, because they don't have the works. They don't have the works. They just know about the works. Now, you ask chair number one to stand up and give a testimony. Quite a different story. Gets up and he takes his Bible and he says, last night when I was having my devotions, I opened a Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, and the Lord spoke this to me. Last night, when I was seven. You see, chair number one has convictions. And convictions rule your life. But the problem is, folks, you cannot pass on convictions because when you try to pass on convictions, pretty soon they become opinions. 
beliefs, no, I'm sorry, they don't become beliefs, beliefs become opinions. So you have convictions, and, and, and then this person is saying, well, that's what my parents believe. That's what my parents believe. Chair number three, it becomes opinion. Oh, that's, that's your opinion. You see, chair number one has convictions. This is, it's, it's um, the commands, the, the, the Christian consensus. It's what everybody else is doing. Everybody else is doing this, so it's okay for me to do it too. This is the command of scriptures, and this is the world, and we all know what the world has gone through in the last number of years in terms of values, mor morals and ethics and character and all of that. Can I tell you that the Christian church, Christendom, is not far behind? All of a sudden, there's this great debate going on. Second chair says to the first chair, you're just so old-fashioned. You've got to get with the times, man. You're just living in the dark ages. Chair number one, man, moved. Man, moved because he's got a relationship. He's got a relationship that's solid, true, and, and on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's personal. It's real. It's a relationship. Chair number two doesn't have a relationship. For him, it's responsibility. He knows he should be in church, and he's there most of the time. Yeah, it's a responsibility. You know, they know that you, they should be giving part of their time, treasure, and talent. They know that. They have that responsibility. But if you're a fly on the wall and followed this person around for the day, they probably <coughs> It's got to be that metal plate in my head. It's gone, Bill. They <coughs> I apologize for that. It's gone. If you were flying a wall and you're going to follow this guy around for the day, they probably wouldn't talk to God except maybe giving thanks for the food if somebody's watching them. Maybe, I don't know. <coughs> But when you have a relationship with God and your children grow up thinking that they have a responsibility, the next thing that happens is that this person thinks it's religion. It's something that you go through, they go through the motion. So you have a relationship, you have a responsibility, and you have a religion. Chair number two wants to claim the verse, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. But you cannot train up a child in the way he should go from here. You can only do it in a chair number one position. So where are you sitting? Where are you sitting? Is this something new? The Apostle Paul put it this way. He said, there's some among you who are spiritual, some who are carnal, and some who are natural. Now, carnal means that you're saved, but you're choosing to live your life like you're not. You're a carnal believer. And if you were a third chair individual, and you think that the church is filled with hypocrites, it's not. Not at all. There are some, I've got to tell you. But it's not. Because there's an awful lot of people that I know that are in that first chair. An awful lot of people who are genuine, what you see is what you get kind of people. Between chair number three and chair number two is redemption. Redemption. Getting saved. Blood, blood, born again. Getting saved through Jesus Christ. But between chair number one and chair number two is this valley. This huge valley. And if I can be honest with you, a lot of the folks that I know as Christians today spend their lives in that valley. They want to be here, but things happen and they end up teetering back and forth and back and forth. And they wonder, why is there no joy? You know, why is God not answering my prayer? He never seems to hear when I pray. You know, the Bible is a book that just doesn't seem to come alive the way it does for other people. Why is that?
I don't really know about you, but I think about that, and I think that there's a whole lot of problem in this chair. Yeah, it's comfortable. It's comfortable. There's a whole lot of problem in that chair. Jesus had a very interesting way of bringing this talk to an end, to concluding it. Revelation chapter 3. He says, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Now, why is that? Why does he say that? It's because the people who are in the middle make it impossible for the person on chair number three to find Christ and they keep throwing cold water on chair number one because they, they feel they need to be pulling them down. So how does Christ feel about that? Next verse. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, how does Christ feel about lukewarm believers? He loves them. He loves them every bit as much as that person. The same with cold. He loves us all the same. That's the point of it. But he's not talking about this being a non-believer. What he's talking about, the word picture here is a picture of, of us like getting a, a cup of hot coffee. And I love a cup of hot coffee in the morning. But I really don't like it when I get it and it's tepid. It's warm. It's like yuck, you know? Yuck. But now watch this. Because you say I am, what? I'm rich. We'll come back to that another day. Because you say I'm rich and become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. First chair. They're sold out. Man, they're sold out to God. Second chair starts out being sold out to God, but, but then moves into position. I'm rich. Possessions and position and power, and it's all about getting, getting, getting. And that's the number one problem. The number one problem. Something has taken the place of God. Because you say, I am rich. But I love what Jesus says in verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Well, again, does Jesus love the believer who's lukewarm? Yes, yes. He loves the believer who's cold. He loves us all the same. But he says, if you're here, repent. If you're here, repent. That's what he's saying here. And that's what repent, repentance is. It's redemption. And it starts out when you are redeemed. You start out in the first chair. That's where it begins. That's the way it's supposed to be. And verse 20 is often used for leading someone to the Lord. But it's not for that. But it's okay to do that. But it's not for that. In context of a lukewarm believer, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. <coughs> He's knocking real loud in here this morning. I can see it on your faces. He's knocking real loud. What are you going to do? If you're here, are you going to get up and make that conscious choice to get over there? If you're here, are you going to get born again, blood bought, and make that choice to get in chair number one? You see, as I said, redemption starts with being in chair number one. And as we read this verse, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And that knocking is an opportunity for us to move into that chair. People don't believe that it's possible to live that life. I'm here to tell you it is possible. Doesn't, that, doesn't mean that you don't. You slip into that valley, but you have the perfect opportunity to come back because he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. You can't do enough bad 
not to be in that chair. And you can't do enough good to earn it. It's only through that redemption. So what do you do? Here's what I come away with. Put a stake in the ground. Check this out. This is back to Joshua 24 again. Now therefore, he said, put away the form of God which are among you, and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God, we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So here Joshua puts a stake in the ground. He made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law and he took a large stone, a stake in the ground, set it up under the oak tree that was the sanctuary of the Lord. And that's what we need to do. We say, as from this day forward, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Can I tell you folks that that will be the greatest Thanksgiving day of your life? Do you believe that? Of your life. Now, I don't know where you are today, but I want to give you the opportunity to let us pray together. We're going to have um, someone anointed in, in the office in a little bit. And maybe you're here today and you're dealing with a, a sickness or, or a situation and you feel the Lord would have you be anointed. Remember, that's his word, that's not mine. We don't make a spectacle of it, but if you want to be anointed, we honor the Lord in that. And so come and, and let us anoint you and, and pray over you. We are working on a baptism, and if you want to be baptized, let me talk to you about that as well. But right now, Mark is going to come, Candace is going to come and, and lead us in our closing hymn. And as we stand and sing together, I want to ask you again. What chair are you in? By the way, I couldn't find a picture of three chairs. I ended up with four. But what chair are you in this morning? Where are you? Let's stand and sing because one day, every one of us are going to be in that place where we will be before him. And he's going to say, why would I let you into my heaven? And there's only one answer, and that answer is that Jesus Christ died for me. And because he died for me, I want to live for him.